Pros. On behalf of the owners and of the staff, I would like to welcome all of you for this uh, evening's event. As you may already know, Politics and Pros have gone back to hosting in-person events along with our virtual book events, partnered events, trips, and classes, so please check our website for a full list. So a little bit of housekeeping before we start. For the Q&A, please remember to step up to, one of, to the microphone over here by the pillar uh, before asking your questions so we can not only hear and enjoy your conversation, but to also ensure that it is going to be recorded. For those of you who want to buy copies of the book, we are selling them right out front uh, by the cash registers. We will be doing a signing after the Q&A, so if you'd like to get your book signed, so just please line up by the pillar, same where the microphone is, after the uh, talk. Um, once the event is complete, we ask that you fold up your chairs, lean them against something sturdy to help us out a bit. And lastly, if you could all silence your cell phones, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, we don't want them to ring while um, the event is ongoing. Now, on to the main event. I'm honored to introduce Mitchell, Mitchell Zukov to all of you. Mitchell is the author of eight previous works of nonfiction, including the number one New York Times bestseller, 13 Hours, as well as Frozen in Time and Lost in Shangri-La. As a member of the Boston Globe Spotlight team, he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in investigative reporting. His honors include the Livingston Award for International Reporting, the Winship Penn New England Award for Nonfiction, and the Haywood Bruin Memorial Award. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, and numerous other publications. Tonight he will be talking about his new book, The Secret Gate, A True Story of Courage and Sacrifice During the Collapse of Afghanistan. The book tells the story of the harrowing and tense rescue during the American withdrawal from Afghanistan of Homera, Homera Kaderi, a champion of Afghani women's liberation by Sam Aronson, an American diplomat who braved the chaos to personally rescue as many Afghan families that he could. It is a thrilling and emotional story that Robert Kolker, a New York Times bestselling author, calls an unforgettable account of a daring attempt to temper the brutality of war. It's all here the impossible moral choices, the desperation, the ingenuity, the courage to step in and help when most needed, the anguish of those who must uproot themselves and take the struggle for freedom to another shore. The secret gate is inspiring on every level. Tonight, he will be in conversation with Sam Aronson himself and Marta Raditz. Sam is the protagonist of the book, one of the protagonists, as well as the global policy manager at Meta Platforms, where he advises company leadership on high-risk content issues and geopolitical crises. He has nearly a decade of foreign policy experience at the U.S. Department of State, having most recently deployed on the elite team sent to Kabul in August 2021 to evacuate thousands of Americans and at-risk Afghans in the final weeks of the U.S. withdrawal. Martha is the ABC News Chief Global Affairs Correspondent and co-anchor of This Week with George Stephanopoulos. She has covered national security, foreign policy, and politics for decades, reporting from the Pentagon, the State Department, the White House, and conflict zones around the world. So everyone, let us all welcome Mitchell Zukov, Sam Aronson, and Marta Raditz. everyone. Mitchell's already spilling his water, but this, this is Mitch. This is Sam. Uh, thank you for coming. I, I love this bookstore so much, and I have so many nostalgic memories from here, um, which continue all the time because I love this place. I, I do not want to talk for very long. Uh, I wanted to do this. I wanted to talk with both of these gentlemen because uh, I met Sam. Uh, about three weeks ago, and we did a story on them for uh, Good Morning America. And Mitch, I am just a super fan. I, <laughs> I think he is one of the most incredible reporters of this generation. And I don't know him, this is the first time I've met him. And I am just fangirling all over the place because his work is so extraordinary. I know he's embarrassed, but it's extraordinary. 
and his reporting and please buy this book but buy all the other ones too you'll be completely engrossed in everything Mitch has ever done I also am uh, through my job deeply interested and invested in Afghanistan and have been there dozens of times over the years and was there uh, a little over a month before uh, the chaotic withdrawal so I wolfed down uh, Mitch's book and the story he tells and the people in it Sam Aronson here and Homera are complicated complex characters you're you're it, it, you're right next to me and stuff, but uh, Homera isn't. She's, uh, and I had the pleasure of meeting her as well. So I just want to start with Mitch, and I want to be, you guys talk about whatever you want. I, I, I just want to hear you, and I'll just interrupt you occasionally. But, but Mitch, you've written, I don't, how many books? Nine books. Okay. This one, why and what led you to it? First, thank you, Martha. I, I mean, I just want to sort of go home now. I'm like, I'm done, you know, like, I'm good. Um, it's amazing to have a reporter of Martha's caliber, um, you know, just to hear those things from her. So I'm, I'm it, I was always taught never be overwhelmed, but I'm a little whelmed right, at the moment. So if I stumble, you, you know why. Um, and it's amazing to be up here with Sam. This is the first event we've done together uh, in the time since we started uh, working on this book and 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 you know uh we've grown close and uh, or i feel it certainly um and so it's wonderful to be here with him and and uh i feel a little bit like i stumbled into his bar mitzvah uh, there's a number of, of family men friends uh here but I'm, I'm happy to meet all of them as well um so to an answer martha's question uh why this uh I do get approached uh with some regularity uh, about you know i've got a great story you really should you know, to check this out. Um, but the second I heard about, uh, you know, I was like everybody else, watching, following along from home as uh, in August of 2021, uh, the events of, F of Kabul were unfolding. And I was horrified and I was um, disturbed. And, uh, but I had no way in. And I, I just, I, I gave money. I just, you know, I wrote a check. Uh, and then I got a call uh, from the woman who is, I describe as the fairy godmother of this story. Through a friend, uh, a mutual friend, Marley Russoff, told me um, there has to, you know, there's a story here. There's an extraordinary young American Foreign Service officer. There's an uh, amazing uh, Afghan ad advocate and activist. And you have to tell this story. And. I get those with some um, regularity too, and they're never as good as as their build. The pitches always go kind of sideways somewhere. This was better than uh, I ever could have imagined because of the people involved. Um, and and I, I, one more point, because then I want to throw it back. I want to hear, why did Sam want to trust me? Um, that'll be interesting. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not that good a writer, I, despite what. Uh, oh no, Martha he's said. lying. Well, but, okay. But I couldn't make it up that there's a, the, the subject representing America is Sam, Uncle, you know, Uncle Sam, and a woman named Omera. Her first four letters of her her name are H O M E. Who wants nothing more than to stay in her home and not leave. Like if it were fiction, you know, you would say, you know, in Dickens, it's like no, it's too on the nose. Stop it. But that's how extraordinary this story is. So I like stories that are so good that if I don't screw it up, it's going to be a great story, even before I walk in the door. And that's what this story was. But I also have to add that there were a lot of stories out there about Afghanistan. And I, I will just say that while you were watching television, I was on television, and I was also completely immersed in trying to get people out. And that was an incredible process. I had friends there as well. I had uh, an interpreter who we were trying to get out as well. But to hear what Sam did and the risks he took and the secret gate, uh, which I'm not sure I've ever been through. I've been through a lot of gates there, probably not that one. 
Um, talk about that a little bit, Sam, and why you, how you got connected and why you, why you trusted, why you opened up, why you, I mean, you're a pretty modest guy. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Martha, and thanks, Mitch. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of go in reverse of the story and start with the aftermath that I, I think largely was didn't make it into the book. But essentially, um, after using the secret gate for some time, um, I had been awake for 52 hours at my last count, and we took off from Kabul on one of the last planes on, I believe it was uh, very early in the morning on the 29th of August, 2021. And um, just, I think this is very uh, symbolic of how the entire evacuation went, but our, our plane taking off was supposed to take us to Kuwait, where a charter plane was waiting for us to bring us um, back to DC. And we landed and we turned on our phones and we realized we're not in Kuwait, we're in Doha and there's no plane waiting for us. Um, which I think, you know, just kind of brought it all together at the end of a really hectic 11 or 12 days. Um, so I, uh, we went to some hotels to, to sleep for a bit and I was seeing double vision because I'd been awake for, for 52 hours and you can imagine that takes a bit of a toll. Um, and what I thought was a one hour nap turned out to be nine hours and there was banging on my door saying, you know, Sam, wake up, come quick, we're, uh, we're going to the charters now. And so we got to the airstrip in Doha and a phone call came in and it was Marley who, Marley Rusoff, the kind of godmother as we'll call it, who, who put the whole story together, who made the connection between Homera and myself. Um, and Marley asked me point blank if I ever wanted to write a book. And that was like the last thing on my mind. You know, I was a career government official. Um, I, I wasn't allowed to write a book. I wasn't allowed to tell this story. I, I thought this was just something that a couple of people would know bits and pieces of, and I would sort of die with the rest of it. Um, but then fast forward a couple of weeks, I was back in DC, and Marley asked me again if I wanted to write a book. I said, there's no way the State Department would ever allow that. Um, and then she called me again a week later and said, um, have you read the book 13, or have you heard of the book 13 Hours? And I said, of course, you know, for myself, I, I started my career as a diplomatic security special agent, which were, were the guys protecting embassies and consulates overseas, um, was essentially the team that was overrun in Benghazi. Um, later, I, I then became a, a diplomat. So I, I saw it from you know both the side of the security folks on the ground in Benghazi, um, as well as you know trying to put myself in the shoes of of uh, Ambassador Chris Stevens or, or communications officer Sean Smith or any of the other diplomats who are there. So 13 Hours was always a movie that I just, you know, I could never not think about when I was overseas, serving overseas. Um, so she said this, this uh, the author of 13 Hours was considering writing a book about us. And to be honest, I laughed. I thought there's no way that this big time New York Times bestselling author cared at all about my story. And frankly, you know, my story turned into a book, but there's other stories that I have in my head of of heroic colleagues who did just absolutely incredible work and will never be able to tell their stories for you know career purposes or just it's not something they're emotionally able to, to speak about yet. Um, so I thought the biggest hurdle was there was no way the State Department would ever allow me to speak to a journalist. But actually, that, that proved to be incorrect. In a couple days or maybe a week or so later, um, I had a phone call with the spokesperson for the State Department and then they looped in the legal bureau for the State Department. And miraculously, like the, the hardest question they had for me was whether I wanted one of their press handlers to, to come with me. Um, and I was frankly impartial at the time. I just, I thought it was important to get my thoughts down recorded somewhere. Um, so we ultimately landed on just me telling my story with um, very limited ground rules. I mean, the, the only real rule in place was that I obviously can't say anything classified. Um, but beyond that, I was free to tell my story. Um, so a couple of weeks later, Mitch came down to DC and we spent like probably 25, 27 hours in a hotel room over the course of a couple of days. Um, for me, it was, it was really a therapy session. I mean, to be perfectly frank, there were times when I, I was crying. There was times I think I stood up. Um, I remember specifically, there's a part in the book where um, I, my interpreter Assad, I was getting his sister and her, his and her husband and their t two kids into the secret gate, and the only way I could describe 
what I did when I turned around and put my bulletproof vest against uh, the roadway was I think I physically stood up and I may, may or may not have grabbed Mitch, uh, put, put my hand over his shoulder and, and like acted it out because there was no other way that I could get my point across eloquently. Incredible. And, and uh, it, you should listen to this diplomat because I know everybody always thinks, oh, the military, I think State Department employees and Foreign Service officers do not get enough credit for what they do and the danger they take, off, uh, take on despite that. We've talked to Sam. We've talked to you. You're going to talk about Homera, who I met also three weeks ago, and her pain still, which will probably never go away. And, and as Mitch said, this woman who did not want to leave and had her young son begging her to leave. Yes. Um, I wish you were here, too. Uh, I, I hope you, if you look at the book, you get to know Omera. Uh, she's an extraordinary person and uh, one of the most remarkable people I've met in a, in a, in a lifetime of meeting extraordinary people. So when Kabul is, is on the verge of falling, when um, Afghanistan, when the Taliban is, is moving toward Kabul, nobody thinks there, it's really going to happen. I mean, even, you know, she, she was hearing things. Her pa family was uh, 500 miles away in Herat on the Iran border. Um, but, and she was hearing rumblings from there when she would call her father. Uh, there would be gunshots in the background as, as some members of the Afghan army were trying to push back the Taliban in the first week of August. Um, but she felt very confident that she was going to be able to stay there when she, where she had built her life. This is a woman who embodied everything we hoped for for Afghan women over the past 20 years. She was incredibly well educated. She was independent. She had regained custody of her son after her husband had summarily divorced her because she didn't want to let him take a second wife. And in this society where her role was supposed to be either to become the first wife and serve tea or to literally, and I'm not exaggerating, or to set herself on fire, she fought back and created an amazing life for herself and decided she was going to spend her life advocating for other Afghan women. And uh, so she didn't want to leave. She, she wanted to, to dig in. And even after the Taliban returned on August 15th, um, I've had people come to me and say, why didn't, you know, she, she was hesitant. Why, you know, why wasn't she excited to, to, to leave? People were trying to get her out. And I said, you know, think about it. If, if, you know, we here in Washington, if somebody said in the next seven days, you have to give up everything you've worked for, your, all your independence, all your achievements, the, your property, maybe never see your parents again. And so she struggled with that. And the work that I did with her was really trying to make sure people understood that because I felt it would be better, if you will, for the story because it was true. And also because I wanted an American audience not to imagine her as, you know, a refugee who had lost everything in a flood or an earthquake. And she had a wonderful life. And so the sacrifice, and the sacrifice is in the, the subtitle of the book because as much as Sam risked so much and he sacrificed, he was ready to sacrifice his career and the and very real chance of his life, she was sacrificing everything for her son. She was willing to stay and, and likely die. She was number in the top 20 of the perceived from outside, um, a group called the White Scarves made a list of all the women in Afghanistan they perceived as especially in under threat. She was, it ran to over 3,000 names. She was one of the first 20 names. It was so clear the target was on her back, but she still wanted to stay. So uh, getting to tell her story and not making this, quite frankly, a white savior story. Sam's a hero. You know, end of discussion, full stop. But so is Homera. She's a hero of the highest order as well, and um, it has to be both of their stories to work. I, I want, when I met Homera and interviewed her and saw her pain and her adorable son with her, Siobash, uh, and as a mother of very old children now, 
it, it is that moment when she still talks about it. It, it, and she doesn't paint herself. She doesn't try to say, oh, of course I sacrificed for my son. She weeps when she talks about it and the sacrifice she had to make, and I want her to stay, and I miss it. And it's, it's also, I can say this as a mother, it's, it's, well, it may not be that I die, and if I run, am I leaving a, a, a bad impression for my son? Should I stay? Should I show him how strong I am? So I think her choices, and it's why I say it's so complex. I've, I've never met anyone quite like her, and I, I love in this book that it is her, that it is Homera. It is someone who is so different, and you cannot put her in any sort of category. She is... And, you know, I mean, being raised during the reign of the Taliban, I mean, we, we all here say, look, that war lasted 20 years. That's a lifetime. It's just, it seemed like a lifetime to me. But she had a life before that under the Taliban, and they're back after all she did in, in 20 years. It's, it's an extraordinary story. I, when I first met them together, and they, it was the reunion. They had not seen each other since... Uh, the escape, and to see them together and to say, you weren't together very long, and it, w it was life-changing for both of you. Yeah, I, I think uh, prior to us reuniting a couple of weeks ago, uh, the extent we had spent maybe 30 or 40 minutes together in total, um, yet there was this inherent bond, I think, that we developed uh, just she entrusted me and I entrusted her and there were times that we did things in those 30 minutes that angered the other person um, and you know I think at least for my part I can say I didn't always react the way that in retrospect I, I wish I would have but um, yeah there was this there was this bond we, we had this level and we continue to have this level of respect for each other because you know what's so incredible I think about Homera is you know for 20 years we were trying to build a democracy and kind of impart our own culture on Afghanistan. And Homera completely embodies all of that. She's an incredibly strong-willed woman who is not going to just say no, who's not just going to roll over and, and lie and, you know, and, and fall, fall off. So in this case, like uh, the book talks about this, but I had told her quite clearly there's no, you cannot bring a bag. If you bring a bag with you, you're not getting into the airport. I could not have been more clear. And what did Homera show up with? Not just a bag, but a big pink, uh, you know, sort of in your face kind of kind of, uh, of of bag. But I, looking back, I think part of me, as stunned as I was, I, you know, I couldn't believe that she completely defied what I had asked. But there's a, a degree of respect that I have to have for someone who just so blatantly uh, says, you know, I'll come reluctantly, but I'm bringing my bag. Um, and then there was a, a bit of a back and forth negotiation where, you know, you can't bring the bag, but I can at least get you your laptop. And that's sort of how it played out over those 30 or 40 minutes. But yeah, I, I think uh, I respect Homera tremendously for her strong will. And it's people like Homera who I, while there were, there's no shortage of mistakes that we made in Afghanistan, you know, starting 20 years ago and ending uh, at the end of the evacuation on, on August 30th, 2021. But Homer is a success story, and she raised her son Siawash as a success story. And these are future leaders, um, whether it's future leaders here in America or whether they go back to their homeland eventually. Uh, you know, if we if we're, if the if we're able to get rid of the Taliban or, or something, um, I'm proud to have met someone like that. I just want to add, um, I saw Homera last week. We did an event together up in, in, in Cambridge. And she said to me, and she, she never says anything she doesn't mean. She, she, you know, she plays it straight. And she says she is thankful for Sam. She says thanks to Sam. Every day she sends Siavash to school not worried about a suicide bomber. That's how deeply she feels about him. And so the, the, the respect I, from the horse's mouth is, is mutual. You, you talk about in the book, or at the very beginning of the book, trust. I mean, it really boiled down to trust and where that comes from, how, how she had that trust. Sam 
you know, Sam had been there 54 hours straight, so he was a little goofy. Um, so he had been gullible, you know, but <laughs> although that nine hours was good, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, very good. But, but talk about trust. Uh, I, I think when I, when I sort of sat, sat back, Martha, and, and, and thought, what is this story really about? It's a uni I, I have thought from the moment I was brought into it, this is a universal story. It's not a story about Afghanistan. It is a story about Afghanistan, but it's not. It's a story about two people, cross cultures, strangers to one another, who choose at the critical moment of their lives to trust another. And as soon as I realized that, then it, that, and I realized it very early on, I realized that that had to impregnate every page. That, that a, a sense of that, of what does it take to trust a stranger with your life? What is it, you know, and when Sam, Sam mentions, and I won't give the whole story away, but Sam mentions that laptop. But that's a moment where Sam is trusting his life with a stranger as well. And, um, and, and he does it for all the right reasons. And he explains that really articulately. And I, I hope I captured that. And so to me, a book like this has to have a central theme if it's going to work as a universal story. And so I, I, I hesitate to say more because I hope that if you look at the book, if you, if you read the book, you'll find that on every page, that what was it about Sam Aronson that he could um, earn the trust of this stranger as she approached him on Tajikan Road? What was it about his character that she recognized this is somebody who, went, or, or when he called her on this burner phone uh, that morning, like, why am I going to trust him with my life and my son's life? And similarly, you know, why is he going to trust her? What was it about this person? And what happened in the moments in the, or the hours leading up when Sam had brought in so many other people, dozens of other people, and, and saved so many lives, but also was carrying some very complicated feelings about all those he couldn't save. And so the level of risk he took was, um, I think, reflected in the decision to trust. And I I think obviously that was the hardest part for you, for the hardest part for anyone, is making those decisions. One thing I will say about Sam, and the thing that stands out, and no matter what you hear today, there's a hundred more things you're going to find out in this book, um, is judgment. And particularly when you work in a bureaucracy like the State Department or you work in the military. And uh, my experiences over the years is, you know, you go and you're in the middle of Fallujah and you've been there 10 times and, and a Marine will say, you know, I have to give you the PowerPoint on the difference between Shiite and Sunni. I'm like, I've been here 10 times already. I don't need it. No, sorry, ma'am, you got to do that. Sam would have said, yeah, just get out there with the Marines. Um, so it, it is that judgment and sort of that moral compass, too. And, and how I, I know that you still suffer when you, when you think about that and those choices you had to make. Yeah. Uh, so I'll give a quick tidbit of I was at, uh, I was at the Abbey Gate for two days um, kind of early on in my time there. And the first day, I was able to get in almost everybody who I, who I spoke to. Um, the second day, the rules changed a little bit. And the rules that we were given didn't match the situation on the ground anymore. Um, but I, was, I had only been there for a few days at this point. I was not totally confident in myself. Um, I didn't feel like I had the ability or maybe the bravery to take any sort of real risk. So I, the biggest risk I took that day was I convinced our security team to let me go outside of Abbey Gate um, and be outside in the crowds. I thought I could move faster, more efficiently by actually being outside of Abbey Gate. Um, and this ended up being where several days later, about 30 or 40 meters from where the suicide attack happened. Um, but I was there you know, prior to the suicide attack. And processing groups of people uh, this day, following the guidelines that we were given, I must have turned away close to 80% of who I spoke to. Um, and we're talking in the low hundreds. And you know, I was wearing aviator sunglasses, but behind those sunglasses, I was crying. I was tearing up, um, partially probably from the dust in my face. But it, it was just these horrible decisions that I was not comfortable doing. Um, and you know, I thought to myself, 
that I needed to do more. Um, I needed to find a way to do more, and I wasn't going to be that person turning people away. That just, if they wanted to send me home, they could send me home, but I wasn't gonna, gonna do that. Um, so when the opportunity presented itself for this secret gate a couple days later, I, there was essentially no doubt in my mind that I was going to do as much as I could until I was stopped. And um, you know, my parents taught me, my parents are actually in the audience here, but they taught me growing up that uh, integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's watching. And you know, in some ways the entire world was watching us while we were over there, but in other ways it was this sort of clandestine covert mission at this secretive gate that only five or six or seven people knew about um, so at that point, like my moral compass told me this is what I need to do. I'll face the consequences um, or you know, sort of more morbidly or I'll be dead and I won't need to face the consequences. But this was what I knew that I, I had to do. Uh, I want to add that Sam is a new dad. 24 hours after I met him three weeks ago, his little girl. Oh, the, there's the real, Layla. The real hero here is <laughs> the my real wife, hero. Liana, and our, our Hi, baby, Layla. Layla. <laughs> um, I can't and the, wait to see her. <laughs> The fact that my w wife was able to leave the house two weeks after uh, giving birth is just phenomenal. So thank uh, you, Liana. Yes, thank you. I, I want to open it up to questions. And I, I, I suspect a lot of you are familiar with this, but the microphone's right over there. And as, as people are approaching the mic, and I, I hope we, we love questions, I just want to make add one thing. I don't know if you, if, if I, I, I'm, I'm so grateful you came out for this story. I hope you'll keep in mind the story in Afghanistan is ongoing. And there was a, an absolutely extraordinary story yesterday on the front page of the New York Times. Julie Turkowitz accompanied Afghan refugees who had to fly to South America and are, were, are trying to get in up through the jungles of the Darien Gap. And who the, the, she included in there the story that, that absolutely just gutted me. The story of a guy who was on the Afghan presidential security team who had protected um, Michelle Obama, oh, pardon me, uh, Laura Bush and President Obama at various times. But because he wasn't technically associated with the American military, he could not get a special immigrant visa. But he was obviously under no less threat of death from the Taliban than anyone who participated in the actual occupation or the, the, the military. And he is now trying to make his way up through the jungles of South America, up into the Gap, and then up pro possibly illegally into Mexico. So this is a story that's ongoing today. And, and what Julie Turkowitz wrote yesterday just, just blew my socks off. So please keep them in mind. Yes. Many, many, many people left behind. Many people still trying to get out. And there's really no way out. It's, it's pretty terrible. Um, on that note, and we are, we will continue to watch this. I certainly will, and um, I really want to go back. Um, take me. It, I'll take you. Sure, sure. Um, anyway, questions, please. Family members are allowed. We've we've we've, we've dulled you into a submission. <laughs> uh, if you have no que no, come on, no. I, we can do this yeah, okay. Socratic Good. method, or yeah, start calling on you. <laughs> He's going I, I around. I teach at BU at Boston University, so I am empowered to do that. Yes, I am, yes, I am, yes. <laughs> I'm authorized. Yes. Hi, thank you all. What a great discussion, and thank you for the book, and, and thank you all. Um, you kind of asked my question, but I'm going to officially ask it to maybe draw out a, a little bit more. Where do we stand? I, and because I, I remember at the time. August 2021, um, you know, I, I think I recall the State Department and the White House saying that, you know, we're going to keep working. You know, there, there's a there's a day uh, where we're getting everybody out and this is the end of it, but it's not really the end. So are those efforts ongoing? You seem to suggest that they've stopped, but ha have they really stopped? And, and, and what's going on now and, and how if there are still folks who are um, for lack of a, a better description on our side who, who want to come out? Is, is that still going on, and what is the sort of status of that? I just want to um, thank you for the question. It's a great question, and I, I want to cite a, a statistic from yesterday's story in The Times, which I was aware of, that uh, we have brought in, and the United States has brought in 300,000 Ukrainians since the start of the war, and I think that's wonderful. But in that same time period, only 25,000 Afghans have been brought in 
during, over that same period. And so there are efforts are still underway, but they're moving at a snail's pace. And there are tens of thousands of Afghans who legitimately have a claim to either some version of an SIV or some who are not getting that help, sadly. And, and they had to leave their papers. I mean, they they were right, fleeing. Or, or they, burn them. They don't burn their papers so that so the Taliban wouldn't think they had any association. And yet, those were the tickets out of there. And those, you know, I said I was I was working on it from my home on my phone and on my um, computer, trying to help people get out and talking to whoever we could possibly talk to to get people out. And then, frankly, once they get here, it is horrible. Um, it, it is uh, uh, the the family we sponsored happen to be English speaking and are thriving. Um, but I worry about the people who don't have someone helping them and who don't speak English because the process and the bureaucracy that they go through is unreal. And, and even some of the successful ones, it's such a great point. So I was um, emailing yesterday with uh, Omera's brother, Jaber, who came in who, who Sam also rescued, who Sam also brought through the gate. And this is a young man who had everything going for him. And he is here, and so he is safe in that sense. But he was working as a presidential aide in Afghanistan at, at about 30. And now he's struggling to survive as a kind of a, a, a low-level worker for a refugee agency. And I'm trying to help him. And we're trying to get him into graduate school and trying to cobble together the money to make that work. But even the ones who are thriving, and, and, and he and would- And by thriving, I mean he has three kids and they're living in a one bedroom apartment. I mean, right. <laughs> um, right. but that's, that's thriving. And Relative. he was an engineer and a lawyer in Kabul. Okay, now you defend the State Department. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I will uh, refrain from answering that one. <laughs> okay, okay, you, you can do that. Uh, can you so, introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Mike Mitchell. I'm the Executive Director of No One Left Behind. Um, we are actually working daily to get Afghans out of Afghanistan, Thank and you. we are helping them here um, through resettlement. And my question actually relates to what happened in Vietnam. and the stories like yours that are becoming there was a movie called the covenant that came out about a month ago um there's a movie coming called interpreters wanted um there are many books and i was just wondering if you could comment about how you think first of all thank you for the book but how you think that it can affect american culture so that americans don't sort of keep moving on without looking back because that's one of the most powerful things to me about your story is that it helps people realize how present it is. It's not yesterday, it's today and tomorrow. And I'd just love to hear your comments on that. Yeah, sure, and thank you, Mike, for that question. Um, you know, I, I, one of the things I've been surprised about since this book came out was sort of, you know, frankly, not as much mass appeal as I would have expected a story like this to have. Um, and I spoke to an author who was a Marine Corps veteran for uh, 11 years and wrote his own book about Afghanistan um, that came out last year. And he said to me, bluntly, Americans don't care about Afghanistan anymore. Um, you know, with this 24 hour news cycle and no shortage of crises happening both. And Ukraine. And Ukraine, yeah. Um, you know, abroad, domestically, um, people's memories are, are not what they used to, uh, not what they used to be. And people move on too quickly. Um, so you know, it's phenomenal f to hear about organizations like yours that are still actively involved in this. Um, and I think, you know, I'll sort of go back a little bit to the last question that I dodged. Um, but you know, I, I, I don't think anybody sitting in this audience would say that the State Department is doing everything that they could possibly be doing. I think there's certainly room to do more. Um, and while it's easy to look at that 124,000 people uh, as a massive success and, and to be Fair, it was a huge success, um, but we certainly did not get everybody out. And there are people remaining behind who need our help, um, and we need more organizations like yours. We need those of us, you know, in this audience, including myself, to to step up and, and donate and give more and volunteer our services if we have expertise in certain fields, you know, law, communications, uh, immigration, anything like that, um, in order to sort of right this wrong that I think everybody can objectively look at and think this is not what right should look like. Thanks. Well said. Thanks. 
uh, I, if I could just quickly here say, I mean, for me, covering Afghanistan for 20 years and not having people very interested in it right now is heartbreaking. And, you know, I, I'm so grateful. It's one of the reasons I'm so grateful to both of these guys and Homera for telling this story and trying to, trying to get people to listen again, because I do think it's a responsibility of reporters when we have young reporters at work saying, no one will take this story. I'm like, keep trying, keep trying, try a different angle, try, try some way to get people interested in this story. And I, I, you know, I'm not giving up on that either, but it's very hard. And, and frankly, it was Ukraine. I think, I think Afghanistan would have continued to get a lot of attention. I mean, newsrooms have a finite number of people who cover uh, overseas or, or really anything. So that has and continues to take a lot of manpower, but I know we as a network have gone back for sure. Yeah. And, and I just want to add, um, when I started as a reporter a long time ago, uh, there was actually a newsroom shorthand for a story. So in the, in the list of news values, proximity is one. If something happens close by your readers, you're more likely to get attention for it. And um, the shorthand in the newsroom was, if something happened too far away for our readers to care, it was actually called Afghanistan. It was known, like, that was the shorthand. Nah, that's Afghanistan. Nobody's going to care about that. And that was a long time ago. It was decades ago. But we're seeing it still to this day. It, we, we, we still have this insular uh, view of the world. And I'm so grateful that someone like Martha, who, ha who, who could go anywhere in the world for ABC, has gone back and back and is continuing to go back and just told us, and we're going to hold her to it, is going back again. Um, and, and maybe she'll need somebody to carry her camera. <laughs> <laughs> that would be Mitch. Go ahead. So this is about this, the same question from a, a different angle. It's a lot harder now to get people out of Afghanistan than it was in the months before America left, when we had our all of our people there. Um, I was very disappointed at the time in, in the weeks leading up where we saw the Taliban overcoming city after city across the country, that we didn't know how weak the army was, the Afghan army and the American support at the time, that it seemed to happen all of a sudden. And despite denials from the Biden administration that it's not going to be like Vietnam, we're not going to have to leave. That's exactly what happened. And we knew that there were tens of thousands of people over 20 years that had helped America, that were, and it was going to take months to get all those people out, and then we were stuck. So at the time, I was actually very disappointed in the American press that they hadn't informed the people who could have then pressured the government to do something to get out, because they, they could have maybe known and reported on how powerful the Taliban actually were and how weak the government was. Can I just, I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want to take away from these no. guys, but I was there a month before, and I. But a month was, too, was not enough time already. You know, it needed months prior. Probably. I mean, but when I was there, I interviewed a Taliban elder who said, we're moving into Kabul. At the same time, you heard the administration say they're not going to go into Kabul. They're not going to take over. They were inching all around Kabul. Um, the interpreter, who we eventually helped get out, said, they are going to come to Kabul and they are going to behead me. And the commander of forces over there, a guy named General Scott Miller, because I was with General Miller as he took the last helicopter out of Bagram to go back to the headquarters in Kabul, was essentially saying the same thing without saying it. I'm, I mean, we were hardcore that this is going to happen. I, I very rarely go on television and say this is a massive screw up, but I, you know, I said it's a massive intelligence failure and got a lot of pushback. It was a massive intelligence failure. I mean, that they didn't know after 20 years with the Afghan army, at 20 years training that Afghan army. Right. And, and you're, you're right, maybe, you know, maybe the press should have saved everybody and said this is awful, but, but there was a drumbeat there in the press, there was. And I'm, people I, on the ground. I'm sorry, you're, the, what was the drumbeat of the press at the, the time? That it was yeah, coming. Oh, oh, that, oh, that, oh, that, you oh, know, oh, okay. we're doing maps every night. We're doing, not right. every night, I shouldn't exaggerate, but we're doing maps. Right. We're, we're showing that the Taliban's moving in. Our uh, producer who was there was terrified. 
I mean, they're they've taken Herat. They've I mean, it uh, all that. It, to me, it was like post 9/11 when the U.S. invaded and sort of the everyone was cheering on. Oh, the American troops have taken this. They've taken that. They've taken this. This was reverse, and and every city and town you heard about that the Taliban was taking was kind of a nightmare. Okay, I'm sorry. No, I think I, that I, 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 Martha has you know, facts on the ground, and she was there and she reported it. But I, I, I just want to add one thing, and, and I have no problem, and I, in, in the book, make clear just what a, what, a, a mara- what a mess that was. But two things can be true at the same time, of course. Now, first of all, the, the Doha agreement that led to this was a terrible agreement. Like, that was a, you know, agreed to under the Trump administration. It was an awful agreement that effectively empowered the Taliban. And by the time uh, Biden took office in January of 2021, the Taliban was stronger than it had been since December of 2001. And it, it controlled or contested half of the country already the day Joe Biden took office. And an agreement that excluded the, uh, the elected Afghan government, which is what the Trump administration did, and forced the release of 5,000 Taliban prisoners who immediately rejoined the fight. And, and, you know, so that set this in motion. At the same time, the Biden administration were dealt a bad hand, but they chose to play it. That was their decision to continue and to, to hold to a withdrawal by September, or at first, you know, it was, it was initially going to be May, but then it becomes by September 11th for the symmetry of 20 years. So there, I have no problem with anybody blaming the press, really, I, I don't. But there's a lot of blame to go around. And there's a, a, a lot of these forces that um, we're only now getting to the bottom of truly understanding what people knew and when they knew it. Yeah, I just remember John Kirby going, going on air and saying, you know, it's not for sure they're going to take over Kabul. It's not for sure. Barely, practically till the last day. Well, he recently even went on as far as say it didn't seem like chaos on, to me. Right. Uh, that, that was just, that was ludicrous. I mean, you know, we've had, you know, after Vietnam and Iraq, we've had really great press informing the American people to tell the government to get its house in order. They're not, they're not doing what they're saying they're doing. We didn't have that, unfortunately. It seems to me, like six months earlier, when the Taliban were already, you know, regrouping, taking over, firmly planted on the ground. I, I will go a little bit to say, back to his comment about, <laughs> about some press, it's Afghanistan. I mean, I, yeah. I, even, even then, I don't think people were quite paying attention. There's a lot going on in the world, but, but uh, it, it, there were definitely reports, and like Mitch, I, you know, I'm not going to defend the press on everything, but it was out there, and that drumbeat was there. Why don't we take the next question? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you. My question is a little bit unrelated. Sam, did you want to weigh into that conversation at all? Or? No, that, that's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just tracking. So um, thank you, Sam, for all your dedication and the heroic work you did. Um, my question, however, is a little bit different. So we have two veteran journalists here who have been uh, have had incredible careers um, informing the American public about what's going on. And I just have a question. If you think about young journalists who might be listening to this, how did you go from whatever your original interest was in being a journalist to actually being on the front line doing the reporting? Um, was that happenstance or design? Uh, I would like to hear from both of you. So please, uh, thank you. I, I mean, I started, I, I think it's curiosity. And, and I, I mean, there's not any story really I haven't ever covered that I want to don't want to know more about. I mean, my turning point, I guess, is when I started co- covering the Pentagon. And it was peacetime when I was covering the Pentagon and then 9-11. And, and by the way, that's the most amazing book on 9-11 ever written, um, uh, Fall and Rise. And then I was in it. And I, I never imagined that I would be a war correspondent. But then, of course, then Iraq happened. We could debate that for a long time, too. Um, and, and I was there all the time. I mean, I wasn't there all the time, but weeks and weeks at a time. And I had a really unique position because I live in Washington, D.C. 
I was covering the White House for part of the war, and you can see policy made, and then you can see the effect of that policy when you go over there. So I felt like I was in a unique and powerful position to ask the right questions. And, and you know, I, I remember interviewing George Bush, and why were you saying things were going well? And say, to keep the morale up of the troops, I'm like, guess what, they knew things were not going well over there. So that, that doesn't fly with me. But I, I think mostly I worked really hard. And, and it wasn't a goal, someday I'm going to be a war correspondent. It, it happened. And I wanted to be there. And I think it's so important to be a voice on the ground. I still do. After all these many, many, many years, m my happiest place is not in DC. It's over there actually seeing what I can see on the ground. I, I agree with all of that. And I would add just one other thing, which although Martha and I haven't worked together, we, it turns out we're just trading names. We know a lot of the same people. She came up through um, local news in Boston. I came up through you know small time uh, newspapers. And then it's about, to, to what I say to young journalists is, is you, don't, you can't skip any steps. There's no fast way to becoming Martha Raddatz. There's no fast way to sort of suddenly saying, I'm going to write a book about Benghazi or about 9-11. Or you know, along the way, certain serendipity happens, or you're in the right place, or somebody recognizes you, you know, oh, she, she can do more than this, or he can whatever. But those first years, those first 10 years in the business, where you know, it's the, the old line about, you know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm walking behind the elephants, but I'm in the circus, you know? It's like, um, you know, you're gonna do that work and not skip those steps. So when the opportunity arises and when the story uh, presents itself, you, she knew how to cover it. I knew who, how to cover these stories. And so when 9-11 happened, so 20 years ago, um, I was at the Boston Globe I was on my first book leave, and uh, I get a call uh, basically saying, your book leave's over. The first plane had gone in. The second plane, I was watching, and I was, I was boring my wife with, you know, well, you know, back in World War II, a, uh, a bomber hit the Empire State Building. This thing's, you know, I'm like, as I'm talking, you know, Flight 175 hits the, the South Tower. Um, and I was ready, and when they said, you're going to be our lead reporter on 9-11, you have to come in today because of the 20 years that preceded it. So don't skip any steps. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for all that you have done and are continuing to do to put Afghanistan on the front pages where it, it just has no longer been over the past year and more. Um, my name is Ronnie Mullen. I'm a professor at the College of William & Mary where for the past 18 years, I've been teaching a course on state building in Afghanistan. And as you imagine, the curriculum has changed quite a bit in terms of what students read and, and the questions we discuss. Recently, I organized a seminar or panel on the moral um, sort of question of engaging with the Taliban. And you mentioned really, 21 was an outcome of the Doha agreements, the very questionable decision made under President Trump and his, um, his henchman, in a way, um, uh, Zalmay Khalilzad, to, to talk to the Taliban. And that got the ball rolling. 5,000 Taliban went straight back to the battlefield. Um, but moving forward, we are now facing the issue of how, what are the trade-offs in, in terms of engaging with a, uh, a government that is the most heinous government that we have, uh, you know, worse than North Korea, worse than Iran, uh, half the population can't work, can't go to school, and, and that sort of moral dilemma of do you engage with the Taliban, knowing what they represent and what they're doing in their country, or do you not engage with them, knowing that if you don't, hundred thousand will starve in the humanitarian output. We so talk about that, Sam. Just when you look, I, I mean, yeah. even during the escape, 
we were engaging with the Taliban. Yeah, I, I think you know one of the most yeah. interesting things of August 2021 was the level of engagement happening between us and the Taliban um, from the most senior levels of Ambassador Khalilzad in Doha, as you mentioned, um, down to you know one level below that. We had we sent another uh, senior department official in to uh, Kabul to lead negotiations there. And then more tactically, we had uh, army majors dealing with their Taliban equivalents out on the street. Um, you know, I was probably this distance with Taliban fighters, but I was never you know, directly negotiating with them. But I think if it shows me anything, um, it, it's that I think it would be a mistake not to engage because we, we can't simply turn a blind eye and pretend that this regime is not leading a, a nation state. Um, and we don't have to like anything that, that they do, and we certainly don't. But by ignoring the fact that they are you know, currently the leaders of a state, um, we're doing a disservice to the, the millions of citizens who are living there. Um, that's, you know, I'm no longer with, with the State Department, and I probably would have gotten fired if I had said that, but that's my, my personal view. Of course, view. Chamberlain made similar arguments, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Want to hit that one? Go ahead. I, I, I mean, that is what the U.S. I mean, we try to deal with North Korea, right? We right. try to deal with all these places. The people you have to deal with are not always wonderful Sorry. people or even close to it, um, in the case of the Taliban, certainly. But I think, I, I think it, it is always a moral dilemma it, for exactly the reasons you point out. If you don't deal with them, do we leave the thousands of people over there without any chance of ever getting out? I mean, they were helpful in, in getting people out in the sort of back lot of things. Um, so. I think any engagement has to be a leveraged engagement on with, with first and foremost, the 20 million women and girls of Afghanistan as our first and overall overwhelming priority. Where can we apply pressure, either if, if it's through the Qatar government, if, if we're not negotiating directly, if we're using them as a bit of a proxy to speak to the Taliban, only to deliver very clear you know, demands if they want humanitarian aid. Because we want to get humanitarian aid into that country. We want to, and, and not to engage with them as peers, but to engage with them as enemies. Because we do make, we only make peace with our enemies, right? And so I think that's the approach we need to take um, to, to, to simply try to isolate them. I, I'm not sure that's going to work for the 20 million people who are being brutalized daily. Okay, are you in line for a question? Because we no, have, oh, 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 okay, okay, got it, got it. Um, closing thoughts from both these gentlemen, and then we're gonna wrap it up. Sam? Well, I'd just like to thank everybody who came out tonight. Um, it's, you know, it's, I have not ever been on a stage like this before next to two incredible powerhouses of, you know, American journalism. Um, so it's a, it's a real honor to be able to speak to all of you and hopefully give you a piece of my story. And uh, you know, if you read the book, there's a lot more of the story in there. And I'm always happy to answer additional questions beyond that. So thank you all very much. Um, a special thanks to my wife and uh, newborn daughter who are somewhere Aww. around here. Uh, I just, uh, I wanna first thank Martha for, for for volunteering to do this. It was just you know above and beyond and, and I'm just, you know, I'm fangirling over here, um, frankly. And, you know, it's, it's very nice of Sam to say that, but the simple truth, and I, I, I have a very strong feeling that Martha feels the same way, it is such a privilege for us to tell a story like this, or to get to know you, to get to know O'Mara. Um, when people trust you with their, sort of the central story of their life, and that you know that I'm not, you know, I'm going to mention some of the, the, the blemishes, and I'm going to mention you know, uh, some of the, the, the hard things. And um, not everyone is brave enough to, you know, as, as a, a young person, um, to, to describe the moment where he's crying in the shower um, upon waking up one morning in Kabul. And so I, you know, 
I'm humbled by that, and I'm in awe of what you accomplished over there and of, of the man you are. Thank you. I agree with all of that, and I, I am honored to be with both these gentlemen. And Sam, you, you have to read this story. It is profound. You will say, oh my gosh, I actually saw that guy in person. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll, it'll be amazing because he is incredibly humble. And I think that's why we both are basically in love with him. So <laughs> thank you for coming. And uh, Mitch is here, yeah. right? You're going to be right here signing books. And, you know, Sam might sign a few too, you know, if you're lucky. Thank you so much. Thank you.